So we're in week two of my series reviewing all of the Rambo movies leading up to Last Blood. That means today we're talking about Rambo First Blood Part 2. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your take on Rambo First Blood Part 2. Here's the big question of the day. Does Rambo First Blood Part 2 hold up 34 years later? I am especially interested in your take. If you're kind of one of my younger viewers, under 20 years old, I would love to know what you think about this film that I grew up watching. Also, I'm doing this series along with Cody Leach, he's a good friend of mine here on YouTube, and each week at the same day, at the same time, we are dropping our Rambo reviews. You can click right on over here to head on over to his channel, check out his reviews. Be sure to leave a comment on his channel, letting him know that I sent you over there. One final thing before we get started, you can download the audiobook of First Blood or Rambo First Blood Part 2 for free if you use my link down below, audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler, and sign up for a free trial. I'm a huge fan of Audible. I do recommend you try them out and you can do so at my link down below. With that said, we're going to get started. I'm going to start this one off by talking about the creation of this film because there's a bit of an interesting backstory on the script process for this film. After the success of First Blood, the studio, the producers, Stallone, all kind of had different ideas on where to take the franchise next. The producers really wanted to have Rambo team up with a partner inside of the film played by John Travolta. However, Stallone was less excited about this idea and nixed it. Eventually, they decided to hire an up-and-coming filmmaker whose only directing credit up to this point in time was Piranha 2 to write the script. His name? James Cameron. Here's what Cameron had to say about why he took the job. Rambo 2 was written at a point in time when I had no money and was waiting to start shooting Terminator 1. Basically, I did it as a writing assignment to stay alive for six months. To be honest, I did that project because I felt First Blood was a pretty good film. In another interview, he said, I admire the film's success and I am happy for everybody involved, but I always have to distance myself from it because it's not the film I wrote. It was substantially rewritten by Sylvester Stallone. While Cameron's script did provide the basic premise, outline, and a good bit of the action for the film, there were some significant changes made. First off, Cameron's script started off with Troutman finding Rambo at a psychiatric hospital instead of a prison. Prison. Second, inside of Cameron's script, Rambo has like this techie sidekick throughout the entire film. Now those are fairly standard changes that happens between drafts of a script, but where Stallone and Cameron really disagreed was on the politics and the morality of the film. Third big change here is that Stallone added a lot of political commentary. James Cameron kind of summarized it this way. I was trying to create a semi-realistic haunted character, the quintessential Vietnam returnee, not a political statement. Stallone described the changes this way. I think I think that James Cameron is a brilliant talent, but I thought the politics were important. Such as a right-wing stance coming from Troutman and his nemesis Murdoch, contrasted by Rambo's obvious neutrality, which I believe is explained in Rambo's final speech. I realize his speech at the end may have caused millions of viewers to burst veins in their eyeballs by rolling them excessively, but the sentiment stated was conveyed to be by many veterans. Fourth, Stallone's rewrites deviated heavily from the morality that Cameron wrote, and this appears to be the point where Cameron has the biggest issues with what Stallone did. In the first film, it walked a fine line. Rambo doesn't kill anybody. He disassembles almost an entire National Guard unit with snares and slings relying on cunning and ingenuity to outsmart them. But the second film, the one I wrote, was by its nature a little bit more violent because Rambo was going into enemy territory. But I tried to walk the same line. He didn't go out of his way to slaughter people just because they were wearing the wrong uniform. A lot of moral distinctions I tried to build into the script got carved away during the shoot. I didn't want to attach myself to that film in a strong way because the end result didn't represent what I wrote. It taught me the danger of writing something over which I had no control once it was done, and I don't want to do that again. This is an interesting one for me because so much of what I remember about this film and identify with it is the politics and the mayhem of the third act of the film, but at its core, it's not like they were talking about big story changes, same basic outline, just removing all of the political monologues and lectures from it, as well as the distraction. 
and you have such a totally different version of the exact same story. Either way, it was the second biggest movie of 1985 behind Back to the Future and followed very closely by Rocky IV. And my understanding is that James Cameron actually went on to have a pretty good little career in Hollywood himself. With that said, let's get started talking about the good. This is actually a really tough movie for me to review because it was such a big part of my formative years when I learned to love movies. Even before I could watch this film, it would come on cable TV and I'd try and sneak in the room and watch a couple scenes when my mom wasn't watching, saw the posters everywhere, I saw the toys everywhere, and then once I could watch it, it's one of those movies I watched on repeat on cable television back in the 90s. It was also a very iconic film of the 80s as the Rambo character was such kind of a big piece of Reagan era America. It was an event film, especially in 1985 when it was the second biggest film of that year, but it was also such a 80s product, a film that could only be created during that decade, really only in this small window of time. So the question of which aspects of this film hold up and which parts don't work so well is very important when it comes to this specific review. In speaking about the good, you immediately have to talk about the John Rambo character. And here, they elevated him from realistic character study material from First Blood into this fantasy war hero character that gets to win the Vietnam War. And there's something about that is mildly appealing that this film is just unashamed Vietnam vet fantasy of what if we got to write the story of what happened? What if we could make right what went wrong with the actual war itself? And it just goes for it and provides that experience for that group of people. Now, granted, that's a very niche group of people by the year 2019, but that in and of itself, like there's something about the fantasy, the escapism of that, that's quite potent and powerful. Along those same lines, this is Sylvester Stallone in full action hero <laughs> glory, not just really even action hero, more like superhero inside of this film, as well as in Rambo 3 where he's the superhero for uh, POWs and Vietnam vets that are frustrated, he becomes that fantastical character for them inside of this film. Whether you're talking about how, just how chiseled he is, his physique inside of it, that he the, he's the master of bows and arrows, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, he can blow people away with machine guns, he can fly helicopters, he can shoot laws and blow up helicopters and all kinds of other things like that. But he goes into full action hero mode at an era where action heroes were excessive, this is one of the most excessive we've ever had. And as a fan of the genre, that always puts a grin on my face, whether I'm grinning a little bit at it, ha having fun with it, it's a bit mixed in all, but it goes for it. Then as an action movie, it moves at a very brisk pace. It doesn't linger on anything too long. You have this nice little intro sequence establishing the scenario of the film. Then you have the title card and boom, we're already in Thailand. We're suit up real quickly in under 10 minutes and then he's off in a plane and the action begins right out of the gate. And it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's only 96 minutes long. The entire second half of the film is basically big action sequence, small amount of dialogue, big action sequence once again, and you get a little bit of everything, whether total mayhem and destruction, machine guns, stealth combat, all kinds of stuff happens inside of the film. The standout action sequence in this one is the stealth sequence where he's taking out a group of guys by himself and hiding in mud and pulling guys into caves and stuff like that. A really cool, iconic Rambo type sequence. And another reason that this movie works for what it's going for but at the same time, some people, in particular James Cameron, had big issues with, was the simplified morality inside of the film. Rambo himself wants to help POWs through action. Troutman wants to help POWs through proper channels. Uh, you have Murdoch, who just kind of wants to sweep all this under the rug and move on so the war doesn't start up again. And then you have the Russians and the Vietnamese who are presented as kind of the bad guys inside of the film. It's very simplistic. Everyone falls into a neat little bubble. It doesn't try and evaluate the, too much of the complexities of any of this. It just sets up a scenario where you want Rambo 
Rambo as the underdog to be the hero and put all the bad guys in their place, other, whether blowing up the actual bad guys or trying to inspire Murdoch to make better choices and care about soldiers more um, through his words and actions in the final little sequence of the film. But I think that makes the movie work a little bit better because it is, by its nature, pretty ridiculous. And it, if you tried to have the ridiculous with the moral complexity of, say, the first film, I don't think it would work well. You kind of carve all of that off and you have a straightforward narrative with what Stallone was going for, the simplicity I think works for the film. And to loop back to some things I said before, this is a film that represents what 80s movies, what 80s action movies in particular were like at that time. It is one of the things that is uh, the epitome of an 80s action movie because you're talking about the excessive explosions, Stallone, the action star in the lead, a take on good guys, bad guys that you couldn't really get away with in the 20, year 2019. So I just as a film, it's interesting to watch it to see how films were made at that time, what was popular and what was connecting with the zeitgeist of 1985 as this film was the second biggest film of the entire year. With that said, let's move on to the bad. And unfortunately, as much as this is a film that I love in theory, as much as this is a film that was pivotal in my formative years, I don't think that it's a movie that's aged particularly well. It's even much more of an 80s product than it is a follow-up to First Blood. It abandons the credibility, it abandons reality, it abandons the complex characters, it abandons the character study, just kind of throws all of that out and instead focuses in on being this fantasy for Vietnam vets. And if you even stop to think about that, that feels awfully exploitive and kind of cynical in nature to create a film like this to cater to an audience in that manner. I don't know, it doesn't sit the best with me. This movie also has a tone and stupid problem. Here's what I mean by that. It has all of the absurdity and stupid of a modern day Fast and Furious film. And at its time, it provided the biggest, most over the top action spectacle that you could provide in the year 1985. Like, Modern day Fast and Furious films provide the biggest, most over the top action spectacle that you can provide in modern times. But unlike the current Fast and Furious films, this movie plays all of it with a totally straight face. It takes itself incredibly seriously, so much so that the movie is jam packed with political debates, dialogue and monologues. Like it really thinks it has something important to say while telling a story that really obviously is incredibly stupid. A lot of fun, but incredibly stupid with a totally straight face. Just stop and think about the premise of this film. The US government believes one of their best chances of succeeding with this mission is to recruit a mentally ill felon who is currently incarcerated and who has not seen formal military combat in over 10 years. And they say inside the film, like, you're one of three people most likely to succeed. What are the other three people up to if they're going to the guy that recently blew up a gas station after he snapped? And this wouldn't be a problem, except the movie does do all of this in such a serious manner without any idea of a tongue in cheek or a smirk at the camera or anything like that. Also in the nature of the story, it's just kind of funny. I, this isn't a big criticism, it's kind of funny to me. The, the plot is basically Rambo goes into a camp and he leaves. He's taken back to the camp and escapes. And then he goes back to the camp and takes his friends out of it and goes home. Like that's the whole movie is basically what I just described of Rambo going back and forth to this camp three different times. And for a big gigantic event action movie, besides the stealth sequence, the action itself, I don't find to be all that memorable. I mean, case in point, the big finale is Rambo flying a helicopter around this camp, shooting missiles, blowing everything up. And so there's tons of explosions, tons of mayhem, tons of bullets fired, but you don't know what any of these buildings are. You don't know who any of these people are. It's just action mayhem, just things exploding up on the screen. 
And there's no specific emotion or concern, care about any, any of it. Contrast that with the first film where you cared about everything that Rambo did because we spent as much time with Teasel and his police force as we did with Rambo himself. And in certain ways, we spend more time with Teasel understanding his character than we do with Rambo because Rambo's just by himself and can't talk. In which case, you cared every time that Rambo hurt someone and you saw the consequences of it. Here, it's just we're in fantasy mode and blowing things up because they're the bad guys and we're the good guys and we're finally going to win the war. That doesn't have as much of a emotional resonance in the year 2019 as maybe it did back in 1985. And finally, I think the movie looks older than it actually is and looks pretty ugly at certain points in time. There's a lot of shots where it seems like the camera was a little bit foggy, probably because of where they were filming and it actually was foggy, I suspect that's part of it. But even the parts that aren't like that, just the look of the film itself, I think, has not aged particularly well. It looks like a film from the late 70s, more so a big budget action film from the mid 80s. It really does pain me a little bit to be so negative on this film because it is a movie that's so important to me and such an iconic film. But I think if you really watch this one objectively in the year 2019, there are quite a few problems with this film. Real quick, before I give you my final score on this one, be sure to share your take down below in the comment section. Remember the question of the day, does Rambo First Blood Part 2 hold up? Also remember, you can check out Cody Leach's review of the film right up here, as well as I've got a playlist of my other reviews in this series right here if you wanna watch through all of my reviews of the Rambo films as I put them out. Check that out right there. Without question, this is one of the most iconic heroes and action films of the 1980s, but just as a film itself, I don't think it's quite as good as its legacy. It was the right film for the right time, but we are no longer in that time. With all that said, as just an action film itself, I think it provides everything that an action fan wants out of an action movie. But if you're a non-action fan, you can definitely skip this one. It's a B overall, it's a 7.5 out of 10. This is a must watch for action fans because it is a very important film for non-action fans you definitely can skip this one. Remember to check out Cody Leach's review down below. If you want more of my reviews in the series, check out that playlist right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.